continuing. They had, we are not told what, if anything, the Magi told Herod. They had no way of knowing his wicked intent. They proceeded to Bethlehem, not because of Herod's instruction, but because at last they knew where to find the one they had come to worship. The Lord gave them even more specific help, leading them directly to Yahweh The star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over where the child was. That the star was not a physical heavenly body is again evident from the fact that it was able to stand directly over the house where Yahweh and his family now live, which for obvious, re obvious reasons could not be possible for an actual star. Now, nah, I don't know about that. I mean, it says in scripture, most high could do anything he want, you know what I mean? It's quoting Ezekiel 10. So let's see what this is. Now it's quoted Ezekiel 10 and it's saying that then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. Let's check what see what this house is. Hebrew or H1004 by Yath. House, house, dwelling, habitation, shelter, or abode of animals. So kind of contradict what he went into, right? The Magi were overwhelmed that this that's why I say. Now, I just read that. So why couldn't the star have went over his own? Scripture said, it, I don't know. And continue. The Magi were overwhelmed that the special star reappeared to them. It seems almost as if, if Matthew was at a loss for words to describe their ecstasy. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. The original text piles up superlatives to emphasize the extent of the exhilaration they felt, thus indicating to us their unique, strong interest in this great event. Joseph and his family were no longer in the stable, but had found a house in which to live until the Lord told them where to go and what to do. It was that it was there that the Magi found the one for whom they had so diligently searched. And at the last, they fell down and worshiped him. And his wonderful grace, Yahweh, by Yahshem Yahweh had led them to his son and allowed them to see him face to face. Charles Wesley captured the experience in his beautiful Christmas hind, which, see that they full of shit? Christmas is a pagan fucking religion. Jeremiah 10 tells you that. In the same Bible that they read out of and worship and celebrate Christmas, it tells you you ain't supposed to. And that's Satan right there. Anyhow, it, I am not even going to read that. Because like I said, that's, you know what I mean, that'll throw somebody off, these fucking demons. Matthew is careful to say that the Magi worship him, that is the child, not his mother. They right that cuts the, that cut the Catholics. You know what I'm saying? That is funny. That's why I say I wanted to read out this book. He said certain things that they contradicted through the, his own writing, or it could be a a, a a female. Who's to say? But not to the ten. This was a male. They knew better than Cornelius, who attempted to worship the Apostle Peter, Acts ten and twenty five. Let's read that one because I've never heard that one. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Oh, cut me. <laughs> I know that, the, you know, that the Cornelius actually was getting sent. You know, he was somewhat communing with the Most High. I know that. And Peter was commissioned by the Most High to go to Cornelius. And that's why, you know, through the Spirit, the apostles say that Cornelius is an Israelite. And I can believe that because the Most High ain't dealing with all these other nations. I mean, he may look like another one of the nations, but nine times out of ten, he's an Israelite because our seed is everywhere. I get that. You know what I mean? Some people having trouble with it, though. They knew better than Cornelius uh, and the crowd at Lysteria who tried to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas which they read in out of Acts 14, 11, and 13. No doubt the Magi were delighted to meet both Mary and Joseph, who had been so specially favored by Yahweh to be entrusted with caring for his own son while he grew to manhood. But they worshipped only Yahweh's shop. Only he was the power, and only he was worthy of adoration. It was also to him that they presented their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Their giving was not so much as much an addition to their worship as an element of it. Gifts were expression of worship given out of the overflow of adoring, 
adoring and grateful hearts. Right worship is always and must be the only basis for the right giving and right learning and right service, which I can agree with. Giving that is generous but done apart from a loving relationship with Yahweh is empty giving. Learning that is orthodox and biblical but is learned apart from knowing and depending on the source of truth is empty knowledge like that of the chief priests and scribes. Service that is demanding and sacrificial but done in the power of the flesh or for the praise of men is empty service. Throughout history, gold has been considered the most precious of metals and the universal symbol of material value and wealth. It was used extensively in the construction of the temple, which you can read in 1 Kings 6 and 7, um, 9, 2 Chronicles 2 through 4. It was also a symbol of nobility and royalty. You, you can read in Genesis 41 and 4, 1 Kings 10, verses 1 through 13. Matthew continually presents Mashiach as the king, and here we see the king of the Jews, the king of kings, appropriately being presented with royal gifts of gold. The savior of the world is also the true king of the world, and he will not be savior of those who will not accept him as sovereign lord. And that's the truth. Um, let me, where's that scripture at? Uh, uh, I want to find that. Uh, those who will not worship me, bring them. Those who will not worship who will not have me reign over them have me reign over them I believe it's, let me see if I can find it. I believe it's Luke 19. I'm going to read it 22 to 23. It's Luke 19, verse 22 and 23. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Because they were, um, what's the word, uh, given a duty to do. And, you know, they, you know, the other two servants did the duty, but the one didn't. He said, Out of, he said, and he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee. Thou wicked servant, thou knewest that I was an austere man. Austere, let's look that up. Austere, Astaros, of mind and manners, harsh, rough, rigid. So this is the Lord speaking, because you see it in red, right? Austere man, taking up that I laid not down and reaping that I did not sow. Verse 23. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank that at my coming I might have required my own with usury? So, like I said, he gave them directions and all did it but one. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound and give it to him that hath ten pounds. Verse 25, And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. Verse 26, For I say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. Verse 27, But those mine enemies, ekthros, hated, odious, hateful, hostile, hating, opposing another, used of men as an enmity with Yahweh by their sin, opposing in mind a man that is hostile, a certain enemy, the hostile one, the devil who is the most bitter enemy of the divine government. But those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. So, uh, the 
The Savior of the world is also the true king of the world, and he will not be Savior of those who will not accept him. So that's just, you know, edification for that. Will not accept him as sovereign Lord. As wonderful as Yahweh Shah's Savior who it was to them, the early Christians first known creed was Yahweh Shah's Lord, acknowledging his rule. The great British Admiral Lord Nelson was known for treating vanquished opponents with courtesy and kindness. After one Navy naval victory, a defeated officer strode confidently across the quarterdeck of Nelson's ship and offered the Admiral his hand. With his own hand remaining at his side, Nelson replied, Your sword first, sir, and then your hand. Before we can be Mashiach's friends, we must be his subjects. Khan, that's the truth. Khan. You know what I mean? Like, every brother that's out here doing the work, from the apostles on down, we know we have jobs to do. So although we may reign and, and partake in the gifts and, and the glories and, 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 and all that this world has to offer, you know, the, the, the booty, the treasures, we also have to do this work. And, you know, that's deep because I was just going through a situation yesterday and I had to talk to a brother about it. And, you know, that was confirming for my spirit. He must be our Lord before he can be our elder brother. Frankincense was a costly, beautiful smelling incense that was used only for the most special of occasions. It was used in the grain offerings at the tabernacle and the temple. Leviticus 2 and 2 and 15 and 16 and certain royal possessions. Song of Solomon 3 verse 6 through 7 and at some times at weddings if it could be afforded. Origin, the great church father suggested that frankincense was the incense of deity. In the Old Testament, it was stored in a special chamber in front of the temple and was sprinkled on special offerings as a symbol of the people's desire to please the Lord. Myrrh was also a perfume, not quite so expensive as frankincense, but nevertheless valuable. Some interpreters suggest that myrrh represents the gift for a mortal, emphasizing Yahweh's humanity. This perfume is mentioned often in scripture, beginning in Genesis 37, in verse 25 and Genesis 43 and 11. Mixed with wine, it was also used as an anesthesiac. Anesthetic. Salakia, anesthetic. Mark 15 and 23. And mixed with other spices, it was used in preparation of bodies for burial, even in Yahweh's body. Or Salaki, even Yahweh's body, which is John, or the verse they use is John 19 and 39. Those were the Magi's gifts to Yahweh. Gold for his royalty, frankincense for his deity, and myrrh for his humanity. We do not know what has Salaki, what was done with the gifts, but it seems reasonable that they were used to finance the trip to Egypt and to help support the family while there. See Matthews 2, 13 and 15. And all I'm going to do is bring up when they went to Egypt. 2, 13. And I'm going to quote it. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be unto be thou there until I bring thee word for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. With their mission of worship and adoration completed, the Magi left Bethlehem, but having been warned by Yahweh in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their own country by another way. No doubt they expected to hear a, at a later date the details of the life and ascension to the throne of the child born in Bethlehem. The warning by Yahweh, by Yeshem Yahweh Shai, suggests that he was directly communicating with these men and that their role in the whole event was by divine design. In fact, it may have been the same method a dream by which he originally brought to Salak it brought them to Jerusalem in search of the king. The use of dreams as a means of divine communication is seen in Genesis 28 and 12 and Genesis 31 and 11. The book of Numbers 12 and 6, the book of 1 Kings 3 and 5, and Job 33, verse 14 through 16. Even the birth of Mashiach was accompanied by other special revelatory dreams. Matthews 1, 20 through 23, chapter 2 and 13, 19 and 20 and 22. Those are the verses, verse 19, verse 20, and verse 22. So the Magi avoided Herod and traveled a homeward route that would allow them to escape his notice, a feat that was not simple due to the nature and the size of their entourage. Scripture records nothing else about these unusual victors, Salakia, visitors from the east, but blessed and, and grateful as they were, they surely, may, surely must have, Salakia, they surely must have witnessed of 
the Messiah in their own country because they were among the king makers of Perithia. It is likely that the news of Yahweh became as well known in the courts of the East as it, as it one day will become in the palace of Caesar. Um, and they quote in Philippians 1 and 13 and Philippians 4 and 22. And with that, I'm going to um, end the lesson because that's the end of that chapter. Um, next week, Lord willing, Adawan Ratazza. Um, I'm going to start next week um, lesson. Um, so with that, I'm going to want to give all praise, honor, and glory to Yahweh, by Yashim, Yahweh Shah, by Hashem, Raka, Kodash. Um, double honors to the apostles and elders of Great Millstone. Peace and salutations to the Akim around the four corners of the earth, pushing the truth for faith and sincerity. Um, once again, um, you know, hope this was an edifying lesson. Um, brothers, you know, just, you know, try and stay in the spirit because I know, you know, all brothers are catching their own sort of hell, you know. Um, and with that, Shalom and a ball, ball.